This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Twilight Struggle. Twilight Struggle was released in 2005 by GMT Games and designed by Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews. This game supports two players and takes from two to three hours to play. In Twilight Struggle, two players assume the roles of the United States, the U.S., and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, during the Cold War. In this card-driven game, players will experience events that span the Cold War's 45-year time period, from the Soviet occupation of Germany in 1945 to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Each player uses their cards to either play through a historical event or conduct operations to place influence points in countries throughout the world. The player with the dominant number of influence points in that country controls that country. When a scoring card is played for a particular region, players score points based on the countries they control there. There are scoring cards for various regions around the globe. There are several ways to win a game of Twilight Struggle. If one player controls Eastern and Western Europe, when a player earns 20 victory points, or if the game reaches turn 10, the player with the most victory points wins. So if all this sounds interesting, stick around, because we're going to learn to play Twilight Struggle by GMT Games. First, let's set up the gameplay area, and I will cover broader gameplay mechanics as we go along. To more easily delineate the two players, the USSR player will sit behind the game board, and the US player will sit in front of the game board. Next, gather Twilight Struggle's player components, such as influence markers and dice, which are both color-coded. Red components go to the USSR player, and blue components go to the US player. Next, let's talk about preparing Twilight Struggle's deck for gameplay. Let me draw your attention to the upper right-hand corner of the game board. In this corner of the game board, you will find the turn record track. Find the yellow turn marker and place it on the first space. A game of Twilight Struggle lasts a maximum of 10 turns. These 10 turns are divided into three periods of the Cold War. The early war period comprises the first three turns, the mid war turns four through seven, and the late war from turns eight to ten. Each period of the Cold War has its own set of cards. You can tell the period each card belongs to by looking at the banner at the top of the card. When the game begins, the deck will only contain early war cards. Upon reaching turn four, the mid war cards are added in, and at turn 8, the late war cards are shuffled in as well. One other card setup rule to cover is that players must locate the China card, which is card number 6 in the early war card set. Once located, this card is dealt out to the USSR player. The China card is never shuffled into the main deck. Instead, this card merely changes hands throughout the game and is kept either in the USSR or the US gameplay area. Now let's prepare our cards for the gameplay area. Shuffle the early war cards together into a deck and organize the card sets for the other two war periods into their own piles. This will make it easier for players to update the main deck once they reach the appropriate turn for each period of the war. Next, each player will draw eight cards from the main deck. The players can study their cards but should not reveal them to the other player. The exception to this rule is the China card that remains face-up in the USSR gameplay area. Now it's time to place each player's starting influence markers. However, before we do that, let's learn a little bit more about the game board. Twilight Struggle's map is divided into six regions. Europe, Asia, Central America, South America, Africa, and the Middle East. Each region is comprised of a group of countries joined by lines. These color-coded lines will establish their relationship not only to the region, but to other regions and to the greater superpowers of the USA and the USSR. 
These lines are important because they dictate the spread of influence. Influence can be spread from country to country following these lines. Now let's learn how countries can be influenced and controlled by superpowers like the US and the USSR. A country can be normal or a battleground country. Normal countries can be identified by a pale name banner and the stability number in the upper right hand corner colored yellow. Battleground countries have a purple name banner and a stability number in red. The main difference between these two types is battleground countries are militarily sensitive to both sides. Battleground countries are key to establishing control in a region and gaining the best victory point score. Also, if a coup is attempted in a battleground country, this will escalate the DEFCON rating towards nuclear war. We'll talk more about coups later in the tutorial. A quick note, if a country has a red or blue box number on one of its influence spaces, this is a guide for setting up the game. We will cover that process in just a moment. Countries with a split color in their influence boxes are countries that are shared by multiple regions. For example, the Philippines is part of Asia as well as Southeast Asia. Now let's talk about one of the most critical stats in the game, which is stability. Whether the country is classified as normal or a battleground, the stability number indicates the independence and power of that country's government. The higher the stability, the more influence is required from the superpower to control the country. Let's look at some examples of how a superpower can establish influence and control in a country. First, if there is no existing influence in a country, and a superpower has influence in an adjacent country, then they may place an influence marker here. An influence marker is first placed white side up. This represents that the superpower only has influence and not control. On a country box, the US places their influence on the left side and the USSR on the right side. A superpower cannot gain control of a country until their influence meets or exceeds the stability number. In this example, the Philippines has a stability of 2. Therefore, the US influence number only shows the white side. When the superpower adds enough influence to meet or exceed the country's stability, Flip the marker over to the colored side to indicate the superpower now has control of that country. Next, let's say that an enemy superpower decides to place its own influence. When one superpower has control, the enemy can only place influence at a ratio of 2 to 1. In other words, they must spend 2 influence to place one influence marker on the country. As a result of the USSR placing one influence marker, this breaks the US control of the Philippines. The US control marker is flipped back to the white influence side. The reason is that the controlling superpower's influence must always meet or exceed the country's control plus any enemy influence. The country's stability is 2 plus the USSR's influence of 1 which equals 3. The US influence in the Philippines is only 2, therefore they lose control of the country. Once control is broken, influence can be placed by either superpower at a 1 to 1 ratio again. Next, let's say the US places another influence point in the Philippines. They would then have a 3, which exceeds the stability number plus the number of enemy influence and they regain control of the country. Remember, gaining control of countries is critical not only for scoring, but limiting the enemy's ability to combat your influence with their own. Now that we better understand how all this works, let's place the starting influence for each superpower. The USSR player sets up first and will be placing a total of 15 points of influence in the following locations. One influence in Syria one influence in Iraq, three influence in North Korea for control, three influence in East Germany for control, one influence in Finland. The USSR player may then distribute their final six influence wherever they like within Eastern Europe. 
This is entirely up to the player, but for this tutorial I'm going to place three influence in Poland for control and three influence in Bulgaria for control. Next, the US player will set up and place a total of 25 influence points in the following locations. Two influence in Canada. One influence in Iran. One influence in Israel. One influence in Japan. Four influence in Australia for control. One influence in the Philippines. One influence in South Korea. One influence in Panama. One influence in South Africa. Five influence in the United Kingdom for control. The US player may then distribute their final seven influence wherever they like within Western Europe. Once again, this is entirely up to the player, but for this tutorial, I'm going to set up the US as follows. Four influence in West Germany for control. Two influence in Italy for control and one influence in France. To complete setup, we will place tracking markers on the remaining tracks. Place the VP marker on the zero space of the victory point track. Place the red tank and blue tank markers on space zero of the required military operations track. Place the DEFCON marker on space five of the DEFCON status track and place the U.S. and Soviet space program markers on the first space of the space race track. Now we're set up and ready to learn the rest of the game. And that covers our first tutorial for Twilight Struggle where we looked at the overview and set up the game. Stay tuned for the next episode in this tutorial series where we learn about the phases of gameplay. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.